like he said, uh, my name is Lincoln. Uh, I'm the Threat Intel Officer over at the International Monetary Fund. Um, I, I, I spell it out because sometimes when I say IMF, people will look at me like, do you work with the Impossible Mission Force? And my, 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 my then the comment's like, oh yeah, I'm like two cubes down from Ethan Hunt, and he and I kick it, yeah, and I just, yeah. yeah, I didn't figure you guys would laugh at that joke, but okay. Um, so today we're gonna talk about location-specific cyber risk, and um, the idea here, what we're kind of trying to convey is that threat intel can help an organization understand the risk that its people and its offices face that are outside of headquarters in different countries. And so that's what we're hoping to convey uh, throughout this talk. And uh, I'm joined by my uh, partner in crime, John Kempinski. Uh, he and I work together. Uh, he's now with KPMG, but he worked with me uh, back uh, what, about a year ago. Yeah. By, by, about a year ago, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Cool. All right. So, uh, so today the agenda, we're going to uh, talk about uh, 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 why assess the cyber risks up, up, uh, as, as it relates to physical location. Uh, and very briefly, we're going to talk about kind of the methodology and threat assessment. So uh, uh, the, 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 the framework criteria and, and So what, what one of the important things to be able to uh, uh, be able to note is that uh, as we stand up here, we're standing up here as Lincoln and John, so we don't represent the, the, the views of KPMG, IMF, Executive Board of Management, so this is just something that we've been working on together for, for a while. Exactly. Yeah. And so um, right now I'm at the IMF. I've <laughs> uh, been there for about a year and a half, uh, but before that uh, I was in the U.S. Army for about 10 years doing uh, military intelligence. And so your traditional counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, uh, the more traditional SIGINT, and then started going to the cyber realm. Uh, so uh, uh, I was actually uh, well, I was over at uh, uh, the IMF for about uh, about three years. I'm over at KPMG now, so I'm a director for uh, their federal cyber uh, 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 cyber program. Uh, so I've got about ten years or so of experience uh, within within uh, physical security as well as uh, cyber security uh, with the litany of uh, uh, primarily in federal and, and federal space. So I think that one of the important things that we need to be able to start to think about is that uh, as, as Lincoln and I were, were kind of batting this back and forth, is that uh, uh, we, we saw that as our mission travelers and our, and our remote offices, uh, uh, people will go out into the field, and so they would treat uh, this, this, this whole concept of physical risk very differently, so it's very different for, for a mission to be able to travel to Sudan or, or to Russia than, than, than to Canada. And so from this, and so they would take diff different protection me mechanisms in place uh, 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 from a physical uh, security perspective. And so the idea is to be able to say, okay, can we make that, can we overlay the, the whole concept of cyber risk? On top, of, on top of this concept, to be able to say, if you travel to Russia, uh, do you need to take additional security precautions from a, 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 from a cyber perspective to make sure that you're protected over there? Yeah. And so before you say that, hey, you know, if you're connected, is, isn't the connected universe the same everywhere? And so I would say that, you know, for every, uh, for every 100 things that you can do uh, 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 remotely, you can do 150 things locally. As a bad guy. As a bad guy, yeah. So that's bad guy, and so and so that's not that's not taking that's not taking away from the from the from the from the remote access possibilities associated with uh, with with compromise, but that's just overlaying the uh, uh, the close access or the third party or supply chain access or the insider access that you potentially have. Yeah, like like John was saying, that's a, a common kind of rebuttal to what we're we're proposing now. From normally from IT people, they think like, hey, it's the internet. If I'm connected. You know, here, it doesn't matter if I'm connected here or if I'm connected in Moscow or Maputo, the bad guy can, you know, get at me. Mm -hmm. And so what we're saying is, no, there's actually, where you are in the world uh, has a direct impact on the level of threat and risk that, you know, you, you face. Yeah. All right, so, so again, so the, the, the examples of threats, so kind of going back over to what we just, uh, we just said, that, that uh, 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 close access opens up a litany of possibilities for potential compromise from governments, criminals, hacktivists, insiders, APTs. Uh, 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 so you have the ability to, uh, to uh, 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 government surveillance uh, uh, and, and, and potential lawful intercept uh, uh, for criminals. Uh, so criminal enterprises operate in certain uh, uh, locations uh, uh, and, and deploy certain TTPs that are, that are specific to uh, 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 areas and so obviously with hacktivists, uh, uh, you have uh, 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 you have uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, types of potential uh, 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 protests uh, that, that are popping up that are very geographically based uh, uh, that, that that can also overlay with the with the hacktivism and insiders as well as APTs that will target specific industries that are that are that are that are location based as well. And, and all these examples that we see up here. Um, these are all examples of, especially in the, the APT and government and criminal case, of where it is different outside of your headquarters. 
So let's say in our case, the IMF, uh, which, which I probably should have started off with this, I apologize. Uh, we, we are headquartered in DC, but we are an international organization. Mm -hmm. So much like the UN, we're made up of you know, 189 member nations. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, we've got offices in over between like 120, 130 countries. So where we have people full time every day. Well, we also send teams to even more than that. So it's like 150, 160 uh, countries in, in any given year. And so the thought process behind this whole methodology is, all right, given these types of threat actors, what is the risk that they face uh, when they're traveling abroad? And so uh, we, I didn't want to spend a ton of time on this slide. I could easily spend an hour talking about all these examples and, and more. Um, I figured everyone in the room kind of could also pull up the examples. I really wanted to focus on the methodology. So as you saw up there, you know, we have the different categories. Some of you are probably thinking, why are you breaking out government from APT? Uh, aren't they kind of one and the same? So we do that for, for both internal political reasons, but then also for um, just kind of being true to analysis and, and trying to avoid bias. So um, from an attribution standpoint, if I internally to my organization say, oh yeah, APT1, so that's uh, the, the Chinese government, 3PLA, they're hacking this, or uh, you know, APT28, that's uh, GRU, Russia's you know, hacking this, or, or Equation Group, that's NSA, they're, they're hacking this. I am effectively accusing those nations of hacking, something which they have not publicly acknowledged to. So uh, what I found is that, suppose I start doing that, I'm gonna have the very high level people in the IMF coming down and me saying like, hey, what are you doing accusing our nation of hacking? Um, I've also, as I talk with other organizations, uh, especially ones that are global in scope, um, they have started doing the same thing. And so attribution for me, the way that we do it from an APT standpoint, when I get a vendor report, I will say, you know, okay, APT1, this is an uh, East Asian uh, sophisticated attack group whose victimology suggests that they hack in line with Chinese national security interests, mm -hmm. which is analytically sound, it's true, um, keeps me out of hot water, good, and it also gives all of the incident responders and, and higher level management and not enough information to go on uh, while not accusing them of being associated with any member nation. So that's the way that we do it. Now, from government and communication monitoring, what we say is that anytime you are inside the borders of that country, so anytime you're physically inside the US or physically inside Russia, physically inside Zimbabwe, physically inside Lebanon, that country has the lawful right to do some level of communication monitoring. In fact, you can look on their, in their laws and yeah. see that you know, in, in Russia, for example, they have the SORM you know, system and laws where the FSB has the authority and mandate to have access to all traffic that flow through their ISPs. So for me, that's good to know because then I can tell my people that are going to Moscow, hey, just know any unencrypted communications you have while in country can be collected and maybe processed, analyzed, and then used for, for intelligence. That's good information for them, because then now they can know if they, you know, what they say using encrypted comms and what they say using unencrypted comms. It also, from this standpoint, we as Intel professionals want to know what are the laws around encryption in that country, because then that it, it, it then informs them what they can and can't take into country, which affects their mitigating and preventive control plans. So that's the difference for, for us as far as looking at it from a APT standpoint and looking at it from a, 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 a government. Uh, Modern communications. Cybercrime, this is a combination of commodity, crimeware, but then also the, the more organized crime, sophisticated you know, criminal actors. Um, hacktivists, you know, pretty self-explanatory. Insiders, uh, we are primarily focused on the disgruntled employee use case there. Uh, when we think about you know, government coercing someone to be an insider, uh, we, we look at that as still falling under government communication monitoring, or if an APT does it, it's an APT. Well, you know, that is more an agent, um, insider as an agent of another one of those categories. But you might take this and, and, and tweak it to whatever works for your organization. Yeah. And what's also important over here is to make sure that these categories are not mutually exclusive. And yeah, so you can, can have, you can yeah, have yeah, an APT yeah. who's also an insider, a cybercrime, who's also a hacktivist, and so on and so forth. And so this is just our best way to be able to kind yeah. of bucket the, 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 the different ways in which, which, which people would, would potentially uh, attack or compromise. Exactly, exactly. And so 
like I said, we are an international organization. That Though we are based out of DC, we are not a US organization. So uh, I, I, even though I'm an American, I, I have to be very careful not to show any US bias or favoritism. So what we've done uh, is build out this methodology uh, with, with, with the hope is that by making it consistent, standardized, and empirical, we can really remove a lot of that bias and, and try and measure all the countries in the same way. So we're really going to go forward and, and, and talk about that. Um, the, the overall model that we're using is very, very similar to the model that our physical security brothers and sisters use. Um, and in fact, um, it, it is pulled from the UN uh, Department of uh, Safety and Security, um, their, their overall model for doing this. And so um, the first two layers there at the bottom, that's where, that's where CTI lives. Um, and so the first thing that you have to do is establish that situational awareness. Yeah, because that really sets the foundation. That is, that provides you as an analyst with the context that you need to understand the threats and understand how you as an organization and your members fit into uh, the, the, the threat picture in, in that country. Um, anyone that was in the military or, or, or government IC space would recognize this as PAMEZI, so it's you know, pretty standard. But I want to know as an analyst, what is the uh, political, economic, and sociological situation in that country. Mm -hmm. uh, from an infrastructure and, and hazard standpoint, I want to understand that because that affects connectivity and, and how reliable the comms are in the country. Mm -hmm. I, I, I need to know a whole list of what the security forces are in country as well as what are all the, the threat actors and threat groups that have, uh, that we know about that have been in that country yeah. or targeted organizations like us in country. So the next thing that we do, now that we have that broad situational awareness, that, that, that foundation, now we start really looking at the threats. And we want to measure what is that, what is the level of threat in that country. And so again, going back to those categories of threat actors, we do it by assessing those five categories. And so I look at what is the likelihood and intent, and then also uh, another thing that I'll tell, talk about shortly called inhibiting context. You know, what is the likelihood and intent and in, in, in inhibiting context for each one of those categories, for the government and country to monitor our communications, or for an APT to attack our people in country, or for a hacktivist to, to start to come after us uh, while we're in country. Um, so then we, we, we take that, and the way that we have done it, in the background, we basically listed out what are the different indicators, that we, uh, the, the types of information that we'd be looking for, for each one of those categories. Um, we then have a standard kind of scoring language for both intent and capability and then inhibiting context. It's one through five. Uh, that allows us, like I said at the beginning, to, to really be standardized and um, you know, empirical throughout the board. Um, so we go, we, we get all the information together, we fill it in, we, we score it, and then, then we end up with our overall you know, threat score. Um, here you, you can see the uh, language for the uh, this, this is for hacktivists, and so oh, a, a one for intent is you know, groups are calling for change. You know, not overly specific, whereas a, a five would be groups call to overthrow the current uh, establishment. Uh, for capability, an example for like two would be uh, their ability is limited to largely ineffective DDoS attacks against undefended websites, and then a five might be ability to gain un un unauthorized access to uh, specific individuals' accounts or devices. You know, so it kind of shows that range. Um, and then the last thing we have there is inhibiting context. Um, so inhibiting context is really interesting. And, and before I showed up to the fund, I, 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 when, I, when I first saw it, I didn't like it, uh, but then it grew on me over time. So what this is, is these are factors that outside of uh, my ability to prevent or control, these are the factors that would cause an attacker to restrain their intent uh, to use their capability. And so uh, a couple examples there of, of high inhibiting context. Very sophisticated law enforcement in country. So a hacktivist you know, might have a lot of intent to go and bring down government websites. They might have the ability to do so, but they might not do anything because the government is really good at tracking down whoever attacks their sites. So that would be something that's not at all connected to us, but that causes the attacker to back down. What I found is normally analysts will go and lump that in with intent and, and, and it kind of gets messy. And it's hard to really determine what is the, the true intent. By breaking this out, you allow, you're, you're allowing your analyst to have a very uh, 
to be a lot more specific and a lot more precise uh, with their intent and also with the factors in the environment. And so, it, it, so it's kind of inverted there. You see, uh, for intent and capability, a one is, means low intent or capability, whereas a one means very high inhibiting context. Uh, and then vice versa, so a five is high intent and capability, but it's low inhibiting context. So the example there is, uh, you know, in a country, there's no law enforcement ability to track down, or there's no laws to prosecute any kind of cyber attacks. So there's really nothing holding an, holding an attacker back. Um, so, yeah. There we go. Cool. And so, so once we have this body of information, so we have the threat, uh, we have the situational awareness, the threat assessments. What we're going to start doing is we're going to start to fuse this data with 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 uh, uh, with with some organizational understanding. Uh, and so this is actually where it gets kind of cool. So, it's, well, I mean, it's cool the whole the whole time. So, but, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So I mean, you're, you're, you're moving. You're moving again from kind of like threat intelligence, IOCs, uh, 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 and, and, and into this realm of uh, enterprise risk management. And so what you're looking at is you're saying, okay, from a from a uh, from a different data points perspective, you're saying uh, this is this is the information that 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 I know to be critical to my business. This is the information that I know that I think the attacker <laughs> is going to be interested to be able to potentially compromise, whether that's going to be email inboxes or or file shares or or specific memorandum for sending. A, a delegation out to a, a certain country to be able to negotiate a trade deal. And so the information on that laptop then becomes highly critical. And so to be able to do a questionnaire, to be able to say, okay, as, as these people move out into the field, what, what is the purpose of their mission? Again, you're going to protect somebody very differently when you, when, when you send somebody on vacation in Canada when you, or versus when you, when, when you send somebody over to, uh, to another country to be able to do a trade deal. So, uh, so, so you take that piece of kind of the, the quote-unquote crown jewels, and so your, your organization needs to be able to define that uh, uh, however they do. Uh, uh, but then, then you marry that up to also with uh, what are the current vulnerabilities on your systems? All right, so what, 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 are, what, are, the, what are the current known, known issues and known risks associated with that remote office or with, that, or with your patching scheme? Uh, 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 and, and so then you marry up the, 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 the attacker and, and, and the threat assessment uh, with, with this quote unquote crown jewels and then with, with, with the known vulnerabilities. And you say, okay, well I know that when this organization goes, uh, then this, this delegation goes out, uh, uh, they're going to have, uh, uh, they have these CVEs or they have these vulnerabilities, they have these audit findings, they have these non-compliance and security baselines. Uh, and the attackers also use and they, and, and they look for and they, 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 they actively attack these CVEs or they have a, a, a and so from there, what you do is you're going to put together uh, 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 risk scenarios. So, uh, and, and I think kind of getting back to what uh, you know, Chris was saying earlier, Chris was saying earlier, this is the opportunity for Intel to tell a story. Yes. Because what we're doing for each one of those categories of threat actors, we come up with multiple scenarios mm -hmm. that help you as an organization to kind of brainstorm and think, all right, what bad thing could happen? You know, I mean, you, you see an example of one of them where uh, a hacktivist targets our um, a member of our organization and then publicly discloses his personal email account. You know, so again, personal email account. This is not something that your normal IT security department is thinking about. They're like, hey, that's not ours. Mm -hmm. We care about his, pers his professional email, but we have no control over his yeah. private. Yeah. But if you know if you know that the the TTPs of that of that organization typically focus on doxing, uh, then those then those are going to be the scenarios that you're going to be focusing on primarily. Yeah. So. And so and so once you have these scenarios, it's really kind of it, it, it's that point that that you need to be able to rack and stack, all right? Because again, not all scenarios are created equal. Uh, uh, so you need to be able to say, okay, I, again, if everything is a priority, nothing's a priority. Be able to figure out what you focus on first. All right, so, so the, again, you're, you're marrying up the likelihood and the impact of each one of these scenarios. So what is the likelihood of a breach of this, of this, of this uh, 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 and, and what is the potential impact to the organization? Uh, uh, so for example, the last, last use case we just talked about were the, the doxing of a, of, of a public official in, a, in, a, in, a, in another country for the private email address. What is the, what is the likelihood of the threat actors internally to be able to be, be able to do that? What is their, what is their capability inhibiting contents and, 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 and what are the security uh, protocols that are put into place to be able to protect that, that, that private email address? And then what is the impact? So, um, and so this is kind of where, again, so as you look at the, uh, the heat map associated to be able to say, okay, on the, on the, the upper right-hand corner, these are the things that we're going to need to be able to address first. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, 
And, and, and so just like John was saying, after you go through, you, you rate out the, all the different, um, the likelihood and the impact for each one of the scenarios, this is what it looks like. And you might be wondering, why are you starting with G and going through J? Actually, it does yeah, it shows up well there. Yeah. Um, the reason we did that is uh, this is the exact same heat map that our physical security yeah. department does when they look at countries and evaluate the physical security risk. And the idea here, by making our methodology like this, we can take these scenarios, overlay it on the physical, yeah. uh, the same physical security heat map, and try and have a marriage of physical and cyber. Yeah. So. Uh, so we haven't done that yet, so we don't know if it's going to be yeah. how well it'll work. But I'm, I'm I'm trying to like build it in such a way that it has the best chance of yeah. working. Yeah. Well, get back to me in like a couple <laughs> years and see how see how it works. And but yeah. And the idea is again going all the way back over to our to our different stepped uh, pyramid. Uh, uh, the reason why we why we took the the, the physical security uh, methodology of the UN is because it's something that's used internally within the organizational construct. So it's easy for them to be able to understand. And so when you say, hey, this is the same thing that our physical security guys are doing, but we're just putting a cyber lens over this. This is the same thing that we're doing again. So, and so it, it becomes easier from an organizational uh, 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 ingestion uh, 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 perspective to be able to say, yes, I, I, I get it. All right, how can, we, how can we make this happen? How can we operationalize this? Again, so the idea is to be able to you know, focus on the upper right-hand quadrant. And so that over there, you know, the example of G1, which is APT. Uh, so APT breach, the organization email, I'm not going to read this, but the, the, the idea is to be able to say, let's, let, let's find ways to be able to address that one before I2. So not saying that I2 is going to happen, but, but from an organizational impact perspective, it's going to be negligible and likelihood is going to be unlikely. And again, when we look at the overall risk level for the country, uh, we judge that based on, not on the average, uh, we, we originally started doing that and we found that it didn't work. Um, and, and, and so what we found is putting it as the highest um, gives us the most chance for security, uh, doing it that way. Yeah, that's cool. And so finally we get to mitigating risk. All right, and so this, this isn't a, I mean, this is, a, this is a, a mixture of both people, processes, and technology, and can include uh, 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 ways to be able to mitigate the, uh, 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 the vulnerability bo or, the, or the, uh, the risk, uh, uh, both within kind of the security operations arena, but also within a business context <coughs> as well. And so, for example, you know, technology can control additional monitoring, uh, 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 loaner laptops, uh, uh, check and wipe devices. You can also have, you know, persistent VPN on if they, if they, if they hit a certain geographic location. USB write blockers, so on, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, process controls. Uh, so maybe there's one of the one of the big things that we found as a as a benefit to the uh, 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 to, to when we were doing this uh, this engagement is is to be able to do do briefings with people before yeah. they went on mission travelers. Exactly. And so they're like, very, I had very, no very, idea. Like targeted awareness is what we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, they, they had they had no idea that there are a number of different security uh, 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 tools and and processes available to them to make sure that they're safe when they travel abroad. So uh, and yeah. And, and the, the thing that I'd say too, a lot of us think, oh, okay, there's a threat, we need to find a technological solution yeah. for that. Um, but I mean, realistically, we're not going to that country in many cases. It's, yeah. it's somebody else in our organization. Um, or the risk isn't something that we have the control yeah. over whether we're gonna accept it or not. That's, that's higher up, that, that's, that's someone on the business side. And so what this does, mm -hmm. this gives them the information that they need to make a sound risk-based decision. Yeah. Yeah. They can say, hey, maybe we're going to go to that country, but if you're going, you're not taking any sensitive information with you. Maybe or you, you yeah, or uh, you can go to that country, but you're only going to use the secure technology. You can't do anything you know, using unsecured comms, yeah. and no matter how inconvenient it might make you. Or maybe they say you're just simply not going to that country. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and this can also affect, obviously, procurement and contracts as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, like, yeah. for instance, if, if your organization is looking at deploying next generation for firewalls or, or, or SSL decryption or, or, or advanced, advanced security technology, uh, maybe, maybe the locations that pose a significant or higher risk to the organization are the places that you, de that you deploy this technology first. Mm -hmm. So, like John said, um, we built a methodology out about a year ago, and, and we tested it out on three countries. Um, and, and so we found that it was successful enough in, 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 in doing just that. Um, we then used that information to come up with briefings that we gave to uh, the, the three offices in those three countries, as well as the people that travel to those countries, because in our organization, it's two separate groups. 
And what we found, um, the way that we did it, we told them, here's what the threat is, here's what the overall risk is, and then here's what you can do about it. We, 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 we gave them information about tools that we had that they could use for secure calling, for secure email, secure file sharing. Um, and what we found is that a third of the people that we briefed had no idea that we had one or multiple of those secure communication or secure technologies. Um, which was great because then we saw the, you know, the user adoption you know, rise and, and people being generally, generally more secure. Uh, we also found that they were much more security conscious because this actually applied directly to them. And we found that they started like reporting things back to us. Yep. So instead of them being liabilities out there, they were now careful and they were also now sensors. So I'm turning my liabilities into, into assets. So that was, you know, I, I, for me at least it was a big win. Um, so in closing, I would say that this uh, methodology is very much a work in progress. Like I said, you know, we've, you know, we kind of sorted it out, but we haven't been able to you know, kick the tires on every single country, and I, I don't know that the three that we did um, are representative of all the other countries that are out there. Uh, we're, we're in the process right now of kind of setting a, a worldwide baseline so we can in-depth in uh, yeah. you know, review every single country. Yeah. Um, and also, I feel very, I think we, I speak for both of us when I say this, I feel very humbled being up here. I feel like anyone <laughs> in this room is probably better suited to figure this out than I am or that we are. So um, your, your feedback, your critiques are very much welcome um, because right now I think we're just scratching the surface on the possibilities here. I, I think that there's so much opportunity. You know, John and I were talking about this last night, yeah. just like for uh, automation with, with, with this. I think there's so much opportunity to bring in other data sets and find ways to make this a much more sound, rigorous, uh, bias-free way to evaluate the threats in a given location. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so um, that actually is uh, wrong. Um, I'll work with uh, you guys to get the right thing. We have a, um, a, a Google Drive where we share all the, the sites that we use when we evaluate the threats and uh, some of like the, the questionnaires and some of the resources, yeah. and we'll try and put more up there yeah. um, as well. Yeah. So, so, so what, what, what one of the other things to be able to, um, so in terms of limitations of this methodology, so again, so we, we started at the very beginning uh, to be able to try to find some sort of empirical way to be able to measure the specific risk. But at the end of the day, I mean, this is still, uh, the, you, you, it, it still is, uh, uh, possible to be able to have observer bias be able to creep yeah. in. Uh, and so, you know, if, if you're looking for something, chances are you probably could probably find it there. Yeah. And so, you know, we'd be looking to the broader community to be able to find different ways in which we can find, uh, where we can quantitatively and, and, and qualitatively remove some of that observer, observer bias. The other limit also on this, this point in time is that it's also a point in time assessment. Uh, so, it, you know, as, 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 as political situations change within country, the risk score is also going to change within country as well. And so those are things that we're trying to actively address as well. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your time.